This fragment of Roman amphora is over 2,000 years old. Its beautifully crafted simplicity tells us so much about the Roman way of life and in many ways represents what the Romans called Diva Victris, known to us today as the city of Chester. This place has countless stories to tell and these are the Chester Chronicles. <laughs> What an extraordinary location this must have seemed to early settlers and invaders. This is the mouth of the Dee Estuary, a place where history, commerce and exploration converged. It is not surprising that the Romans settled here, very soon making Diva Victris the largest fortress in Britain. The Dee Estuary is more than just a body of water. It was a lifeline connecting the Romans to the rest of the world. The Romans arrived in Britain in AD 43, but that was down in the southeast. Uh, they then spent a couple of decades kind of making their way through Britain. Um, they would send out surveyors uh, ahead of the main legion to, to check out for, for suitable placements. Um, for a fortress so they were looking for things like fresh water for elevation for a fortress they were looking for good trade routes um, they were also looking for a sympathetic local people um, the cannabis people that they could be trading with um, so while they could import some things that they needed for survival it would make life much easier if they could trade with the local people for things like grain well when they arrived in the northwest uh, what they found was uh, perfect conditions if you like so uh, in the in the Welsh hills there was down the Cluidians uh, there was a natural barrier between Welsh tribes um, but if they had control of the North Welsh coast they could access the, the, um, the precious metals um, that could be mined all up all the way along that north coast of Wales. The wonderful thing about the the sighting of uh, the fortress at Beaver was that um, it gave them access to the estuary and to the sea, to the Irish Sea. From there, they could make their way over to Ireland. Most importantly, it gave them trade routes back to the Mediterranean. Foodstuffs were transported in, in carrying jars. So we have a piece of jar here. Um, this is probably, would probably have been about uh, 18 inches high. You can see by the shape of what we have left that it was probably a fairly rounded um, kind of pot-bellied jar. Diva Victris enjoyed a constant flow of goods, crucial to the Roman way of life. Olive oil, wine, and that indispensable ingredient for many Roman dishes, garum. What were staples for the Romans are still very much at home in the 21st century kitchen. Even the ubiquitous garum has experienced reincarnations and is fundamentally the same age-old recipe so cherished by the ancients. Garum was meticulously crafted from the layering of oily fish, aromatic herbs and copious amounts of salt. The role of salt for the Romans as seasoning, preserver and even currency cannot be overstated. And here on the doorstep of Diva Victrix, they struck gold, white gold. Prior to the Romans arriving, they were already making salt from the brine that was coming up from underneath the ground. Um, and they were then using this salt, uh, boiling it, evaporating the water off, and using the salt for uh, preserving food. So this was absolutely crucial for the Romans, who uh, for, for a lot of the time just left a skeleton staff in Fortress Diva, uh, while the rest of the, the legion was off on other missions. Um, but without salt, they wouldn't have been able to do this because they would not have been able to preserve the food to keep them going for their, for their long route marches. So salt was crucial. 
Soldiers in this vast occupying force were not always victorious. One unfortunate legionary is said to still haunt parts of ancient Chester to this very day. It is a tale of forbidden love between a Roman soldier and a local girl. Despite the conquest of their territory, the Welsh tribes posed a threat to the occupying Roman forces. The story goes that the Roman captain of the guard was enticed by a seductive Welsh girl to leave his post. During his absence, the remainder of his men were killed by Welshmen. In utter despair and shame, the captain killed himself by falling on his sword. His restless and remorseful spectre now patrols the walls that he abandoned in life. The identity of this languishing captain of the guard is unmarked by any memorial. However, Diva Victrix left behind huge numbers of tombstones which recall in vivid detail the passing of Romans who spent a lifetime here. The beauty of these stones is testimony not only to the very foundation on which the fortress Diva was built but also to the dominance of a momentous Roman deity. One of the brilliant things about Chester when the Romans arrived was the, the rock that was uh, just, you know, that's what Chester is built on, on this sandstone. Um, so the Romans were very keen to use that to build the fortress, but uh, just over the river, there's um, a, a kind of rocky cliff or quarry. Um, part of that is called, now called Edgar's Field, and in Edgar's Field we have something called Minerva's Shrine. Amidst the pantheon of Roman deities, Minerva emerged as a figure of profound importance. A goddess of wisdom, knowledge, craftsmanship and warfare, her divine influence cast a wide net, shaping the very essence of Diva Victris. As Chester flourished under Minerva's watchful gaze, its artisans brought forth astonishing works, from masterpieces to everyday creations. Among these were the exquisitely carved tombstones, which hold silent stories of lives lived in the shadow of history. In the narratives of conquest, and camaraderie, love and loss, Chester's history is not confined to dusty books and lifeless artifacts. It resonates within the very stones upon which this city is built, beckoning us to explore and discover the untold stories of others who have walked these timeless streets in the Chester Chronicles.